this presentation. Okay. You'll be able to check it. All right. So that's running. I don't think that's that, clock time right now. Right. So it does say 7:30. Do you have some idea? Do you want me to give you a high sign at some point? Um, if I'm, I don't ha believe I have a long presentation. Okay. But then we won't worry about it. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hi, I'm Dan Graboy. I'm the curator of, let me start over. I am the curator of Soundwaves. This is the 13th year uh, of this series, and it is my 13th year here at UW. The original idea of Soundwaves was there are people who like to listen to um, intellectual and informative lectures, and there are people who like to listen to music, and why not combine those audiences? And from such humble beginnings, we got to this idea of a thematic approach where different researchers talk about a common theme from their own angle, not trying necessarily to relate to each other, but just each to the theme. And then we have a talk about music as it relates to the theme, and then we have a performance as it relates to the theme. This year, in, sort of in alongside the 175th anniversary of UW-Madison, we've decided to look at the passage of time, at anniversaries, um, and have all of our talks deal with events of the past and, uh, and relate them to what's happening in present day. So I, for me, it's particularly wonderful today uh, to talk about anniversaries because it happens to be my anniversary. Thank you. 
22 happy years. And Meg is here tonight. Um, so a couple of other notes before we begin. Uh, the next Soundwaves event will be on December 1st. They're always on Fridays at 7.30, so you can mark your calendar. Again, it's going to be um, a potpourri of anniversary celebrations, probably from lots of radically different fields of research. Also, out here by the gentleman with the lanyard that's bright yellow, there is a Soundwaves poster, and it has a QR code. And if anybody, no pressure, but if anybody is interested in contributing to uh, monetarily to Soundwaves, um, I think if you point your camera at that code, the rest is self-explanatory. Um, so uh, please, no pressure. But if you are interested in doing that, of course, it is always very much appreciated. I think that's all I had to say for now. I'm so thrilled to have four brilliant researchers and an amazing musician here tonight. So enough of me. Let's get on with Amy Weeks. Hey. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? I guess that's the thing you only really have to say over Zoom. but. Um, my name is Amy Weeks. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry here at UW-Madison. Um, and my lab's research program focuses on how signals are sent and received in biology and how this process can go awry in human disease. And tonight, Dan invited me here, and thank you for the invitation, Dan, to um, reflect on the anniversary of the sort of discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. And when we say this is the anniversary of the discovery, um, I think many of us appreciate that science unfolds over years. But the reason that we would um, say that this discovery was made in 1953 is that this issue of the journal Nature was published on April 25th, 1953. And this issue fe featured three seminal papers that told us, um, that sort of elucidated the structure of DNA as we know it now. So one of these papers contained this very famous x-ray image of DNA um, that has this characteristic cross pattern that tells us that this was a double helical structure. And this was generated by Rosalind Franklin. And then this was a key piece of data that allowed James Watson and Fran Francis Crick to make their proposal of what the structure of DNA looked like, which is um, this drawing that was featured in their paper here. So this is the DNA double helix, which I think um, is very um, vaunted as sort of holding the secrets of life. So DNA has this two-stranded structure that provides a natural way for it to be copied. So these two strands can be separated, and one can act as a template to enable a second copy of DNA to be made. So this is how we can start out as just one cell and grow into few, full humans. Our genome can be copied and contain all of the information um, that is encoded in the genome. So what does it mean for information to be encoded in the genome? What does DNA actually do? What information is it holding? Um, this was a discovery that took um, several more years after, after the discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. Um, and this was um, the function of DNA and the information it was encoding was proposed by Francis Crick, who was also involved in the discovery of the structure. Um, and he referred to this as the genetic code. So, Crick postulated that the information that DNA holds is the sequence that makes up proteins. So DNA can be not only copied to make more copies of itself, but it can also be translated into a different set of biomolecules that will enable biological function. Um, and this basically is encoded in the sequence of bases. So A, T, C, and G that we find in DNA can encode the sequence of a protein, which has a more complex set of building blocks. And our current understanding of how the genetic code can be translated into protein um, is schematized here. So DNA is first um, copied into another type of nucleic acid molecule called mRNA. The M stands for messenger. So this is a messenger that carries the genetic information from the nucleus of a cell, where all of the um, DNA is stored, into the cytosol, where protein translation takes place. And proteins are translated from this messenger RNA on a protein synthesis machine called the ribosome. And on the ribosome, adapter molecules called tRNAs connect this sequence of nucleic acid bases 
to the amino acid building blocks that make up a protein. So this machine can synthesize the structure of a protein that's sort of schematized by all these different colors here. So these are different chemical functional groups that are all connected together and can carry out biological functions. And the reason that I like to pivot from DNA to protein is that I think of proteins as sort of the executors of biological function. They're the molecules in the cell that are actually doing things. So what kinds of things can proteins do in our cells? Um, one of them that we're probably very familiar with in the context of mRNAs is they can um, template proteins that support an immune response. So um, many of us have probably had an mRNA vaccine, for example, that was used to synthesize proteins that prompted the production of antibodies um, against coronaviruses. Proteins can also catalyze chemical reactions that are involved in processes like digestion and extraction of energy from the food that we eat. Um, in plants, plants use enzymes or catalysts of chemical reactions to fix carbon dioxide and actually make plant biomass, so things like leaves and the stalks of trees. And then proteins can also be used for molecular transport. So one really important example um, that all of us are doing right now is that proteins are involved in oxygen transport. So the red color in our blood comes from binding of oxygen to a protein called hemoglobin that carries it all throughout our bodies from our lungs. So these are the important functions of proteins. And this is how Crick related um, the sequence of DNA to the sequence of a protein. So he proposed um, what he called the doctrine of the triad, which is now known as the central dogma of molecular biology. So this sort of launched the whole field of molecular biology um, and projects like the Human Genome Project, for example. So the way Crick drew it, he said that a molecule of DNA um, encodes a corresponding molecule of RNA, and that RNA templates the synthesis of a protein. And when we look at this drawing, we might think to ourselves, okay, so when we have one gene in a molecule of DNA, that corresponds to one type of protein molecule because it's telling us what the sequence of that protein is. But proteins are actually much more exciting than that because they can do a lot of functions and carry a lot of chemical functional groups that aren't actually encoded in the genetic code. And this enables them to do a lot of really cool things that are relevant to our lives in many ways. So um, protein signaling, for example, involves recognition of a signal by a protein that's on the cell surface. It's represented by this little cup here. And when that signal is recognized, proteins inside the cell can be modified um, what's referred to as post-translationally, so after the protein is made. And this is not templated by DNA. So these are chemical reactions that occur um, through protein catalysis. And this enables a signal that is on the extracellular side of a cell, so something the cell encounters in its environment and needs to respond to, to be relayed um, through the cell, um, ultimately in many cases to the nucleus, and to alter the expression of genes, so what the composition of proteins in the cell um, is. So in this schematic on the left, um, I'm showing a general scheme for what's called phosphorylation signaling. So this P stands for phosphate. So this is a chemical functional group that is attached to proteins and is the currency of cellular signaling. So it's carried along and transmitted from one protein to the next until finally it leads to an output. In the middle, we're looking at some signaling that's involved in communication between cells. So these two gray rectangles here are representing two different cells that need to talk to each other. So these might be a typical cell in your body and an immune cell that Maybe that cell has been infected by a virus and the immune cell wants to destroy it. They need to have ways of communicating with one another and they do this through proteins. So a protein-based ligand is expressed on one cell and binds to a protein on the second cell. And in this case, the signal is transmitted within the cell through protein cleavage. So separation of those groups that the ribosome brought together into two different chains. So now from one gene, we might end up with more than one protein. And this can also lead to um, a signal that alters gene expression in a cell to respond to environmental cues. And then here's one more case of signaling through protein cleavage in which an extracellular signal um, leads to, rather than a cascade of phosphorylation, a cascade of protein cleavages. 
So this can cause many different things to happen to proteins. Maybe they have partner proteins that they bind to and no longer bind to. Maybe after they're cleaved, they have new protein partners that they bind to that they didn't bind to before. Or since the, um, a human cell, for example, is highly compartmentalized, this cleavage event might cause a protein to um, move from the cell surface into the nucleus, for example. Um, and this is a specific pathway that I'm showing here that leads to cell death. So through many protein cleavage events, it's sort of death by a thousand cuts. There are all these proteins getting cleaved in the cell. Their functions are changing, not necessarily being um, inactivated, but they're doing different things to sort of package the cell up for a programmed death pathway. So why, would, why do we have programmed cell death? Why do our cells want to die? How is this important for biology? Programmed cell death is a means of eliminating cells that aren't working. So in normal biology, for example, you might um, have heard before that when a baby is developing, its fingers start out webbed. And then those webbed webs disappear by the time the baby's born, and they have 10 fingers and 10 toes. And the process of apoptosis, or programmed cell death, is what eliminates those um, cells that are no longer needed. So it's, this is important for human development. Um, in other cases, there might be something, some insult to the cell that's occurred. So maybe inject infection by a pathogen, like a virus or a bacterium, or um, a mutation has arisen that might lead to out of control growth in the development of a tumor. And programmed cell death can also eliminate those types of cells that are no longer needed or that might be deleterious to an organism. So this image on the right shows a macrophage, which is stained in pink, engulfing um, a cell that's undergoing this programmed cell death pathway. And this is a very um, orderly way of eliminating that cell. So rather than just um, blowing up and spurting its contents everywhere, the cell has neatly packaged itself up through all of these protein cleavages so that it can be eliminated in an orderly fashion and not provoke any inflammation. And one particular pathway of programmed cell death that my lab is interested in is called apoptosis. And this word, apoptosis, is from the Greek for falling leaves. So every fall, um, trees lose their leaves. It's just a natural part of their life cycle. And apoptosis is a programmed cell death pathway that's kind of like that. Um, so it's a very um, natural and um, basically healthy way for cells to die. So all of these leaves that are falling, and in my mind, I always think of as the proteins that are being cleaved, and they're sort of losing pieces and dropping leaves. Um, and one thing that we're really interested in studying, so sort of as a follow-up to the Human Genome Project, is the Human Proteome Project. So understanding what is the composition of all of the proteins across um, all of the biomolecules in a cell. So how can we figure out what's happened to the proteins that's not genetically encoded? Um, and this can be very difficult because only a few proteins out of the around 30,000 genes that humans have, um, we could have up to 30,000 proteins in a cell, and maybe a few hundred to a few thousand of them are actually cut in this proteolytic signaling pathway. So we've been very interested in mapping out what those proteins are that aren't genetically encoded, and we need new tools for this. So finding one of these specific proteins is sort of like searching for a needle in a haystack. So we have all of these normal proteins in the cell that haven't been cut, that are doing their normal functions. And then what we would like to find is, what do these needles look like? Is there a way that we can pull those out from all of these um, proteins in the cell and figure out what are all of these thousands of cuts that occur during programmed cell death? Um, which ones actually matter and which ones are bystanders? And can we figure out a way, um, if we have a human disease state like cancer, to reactivate this apoptosis pathway to prevent those cells from growing out of control. So in my lab, um, we developed tools that would be akin to using a magnet to pull these needles out of the haystack so that we just end up with a pile of needles. And then we can focus our analysis on this stack of needles and figure out which, which um, proteins have been cut in this analogy. So what this has enabled us to do is to develop a proteome scale map of apoptosis. So this is a data set from my lab in which we are able to identify a few hundred proteins under a specific set of conditions, um, treatment with an anti-cancer agent namely, that are cleaved during apoptosis. So we are able to map out what these few hundred proteins are out of around 30,000 proteins that are encoded in the cell 
and to figure out exactly what they look like in terms of their amino acid sequence and not just their gene sequence. So I'll stop there, um, and hopefully you appreciate the relationship between what's genetically encoded and what's not. All right. Hi there. My name is Victor Ujor. I'm an assistant professor in food science. Um, thanks, Dan, for having me. Dan asked me to talk about fermentation um, in recognition of the ban on alcohol years ago, or the anniversary of the ban on alcohol, hence bootlegging. So I started thinking about what society would look like today without alcohol. Then I started having Halloween nightmares as so, so I thought about it. I thought, OK, how do I get rid of these nightmares? I said, OK, I'm going to teach people how to make beer and wine. And I felt better after I said that. So I think anything, any living thing that can produce alcohol, the good stuff, which is what I have here. We brewed this in my lab, actually. Any living thing that can do that is really, really smart. To give you an example, I'll tell you a story before I get right into the science of fermentation. Someone got a job at the brewing plant. Young man, he was so excited. That was his first job. And looking at the computers, doing stuff every day. So one day, the computer was saying there was something wrong with one of the fermentation tanks. So he had to climb up and look and open it at the top, and he saw something there. He tried to pick it. He fell into the tank. All the computers were blaring. Woo, 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 there's something wrong. You look at the screen. It says, man in the tank, man in the tank. <laughs> Five minutes later, the computer started saying, tank in the man, tank <laughs> in the man. And that tells us that alcohol is the good stuff. So I'll talk about fermentation. What is really fermentation? Often we try to define it very scientifically, which I'm going to give you in a moment. But I think it's simply microorganisms eating sugar. Just like we love sugar, they love sugar. When we feed particular microorganisms sugar, they just break it down and make something we happen to love. Simply, fermentation is a breakdown of sugars, all kinds of sugars, by specific microorganisms, often, not always, in the absence of oxygen to produce alcohol and or acid. We can use that to make cheese and vinegar and wine and what have you. I'll just talk about how we make beer and wine specifically today. The good stuff. <laughs> Two of them are produced exactly, almost exactly the same way, with minor variations here and there. You need sugar. With that sugar, you need yeast. Fermentation happens. Microorganisms will eat the sugar. And they produce alcohol for you. All of them, both of them rather, will follow the same particular steps. You must have to have a substrate. This is the sugar or the source of the sugar. In the case of wine, it's grape. In the case of beer, it is the cereal we use to make the beer. Then you have to have physical processing. If I take grape and feed it to, to, to yeast, it's not going to ferment it until I break it open. I have to feed them the sugar. The same thing with grains, we have to grind them down and access the sugar. So there must be physical processing. And then there's microbial activity where biochemical reactions, a lot of them will happen. And the microorganisms will make the product, which is that good stuff that I have here. So let's look at how beer is made. How do we make beer? Often, we need a substrate. And the substrate is often barley. And people ask me, is that the only grain we use to make beer? No, you can use anything from corn to oats to rice and what have you. But it's rare that you don't have barley there. A lot of reasons for that. One of them is that barley has a much lighter flavor than the other grains. If you make beer solely on corn, absolutely it will work because that sugar to alcohol that you feed to yeast. However, it will have a character characteristic corny flavor, so to speak, or ricey flavor, or oaty flavor. But barley is much lighter. It doesn't do that. But there's another reason. I'm going to go over and come right back to that strain. There's another reason why. We use barley. If you take barley, grind it down, feed it to yeast, it doesn't ferment it because you cannot use starch. What you have in the grain is starch, and yeast cannot ferment. You cannot utilize starch. You have to help yeast a little bit by breaking the starch to sugars. And those sugars are usually maltose and glucose and oligosaccharides, and yeast can then utilize that. Now, you find out that 
barley has a lot of enzymes naturally. If I take a barley grain and drop it like any other grain, it will begin to grow. Why does it grow? Because it's got starch in it, which is a stored food. It breaks it down by itself, begins to feed that. That's the first source of energy before it actually develops roots that will go into the, into the ground and begin to find food. So that food there, that happens by means of enzymes. And barley is characteristically rich in enzymes, amylases that can break starch down. Rice does have it, oat does have it, but not, not as much as barley. And that's why it's rare to make beer without barley, because that supplies the enzymes you need to break the starch down in the first process of beer making. Over there, you can see before you do that, there's what we call malting. The grains over there look like they've germinated, and that's because they actually germinated. Malting is controlled germination of grains. So what we do, we take the grains, spread them out, with good air supply and water, they begin to germinate. We fool them into believing they're gonna grow, then we stop the process and kill them off. So we dry them out and keep them. The enzymes will later do the work during the process of what we call mashing, which is when we grind the grains down. If we grind them down, you can take oat and, and oh, put two oats there, forgive me, oat and rice and whatever, mix them all together with your barley and raise the temperature to about 62, 68 degrees Celsius those enzymes that were developed during the controlled germination process will begin to work and break the starch down to sugars. And that is what you can now feed to your yeast over there, which will do all sorts of biochemical reactions we can't get into today for lack of time to make that good stuff. So this is an overlay of what fermentation looks like to make beer. You have your malted grains. You can mix it with any other kind of grain that is not malted. We call those adjuncts. So I'm trying to see here. All right. You call those adjuncts. You grind them down, mix with water, raise the temperature to about 60 to 68 Celsius. You do that gently. And then as temperature rises, the enzyme developed in the mold will break down the starch to give you a lot of sugars. After that, you pass that to your lab to turn which is simply where you filter all the grits. It's the residues from the grains are filtered off, and you move that to your hops, um, so sorry, to your ke brew kettle, where you add hops. And hops is simply this beautiful flowering plant that the flowers contain bitter flavor. The bitter flavor of beer comes from hops. But essentially, it's not just that we add them for bitter flavor in beer, we add hops specifically for preservation. While we boil here to ensure that microorganisms we don't want do not grow in the environment, when it cools down, you start fermenting, it could get infected by unwanted microorganisms, which is something you want to avoid. Hops contains particular compounds called hop acids. They are humulone and cohumulone. These are compounds that kill a wide variety of microorganisms, but yeast can survive it. So once you add it there, those acids are produced uh, they isomerize at high temperature and get ready to kill whatever we don't want. After that, we filter everything off and you have a clean solution that you cool down, pass it into your fermentation tank, and fermentation happens here where you add the yeast, your pitch. After fermentation, there's a secondary fermentation like in wine, but in beer making, the secondary fermentation is very short. It lasts for a few days, about a week or thereabouts, and the beer can be packaged in whatever form you want it. There are two major kinds of beer. Of course, there are lots and lots of kinds of beer, but two major kinds, we call them lager and ale. What is responsible for lager is simply, lager and ale are simply their colors. Lager beers are lighter, ale are much darker. Why? Because during the malting process, or rather after the malting process, the grains are, gr are dried at much higher temperatures for ale. So if you did that much higher for a longer period of time, you char the grains a little bit, they get darker. By the time you ferment, you're gonna get a much darker beer. And also, the other difference between them is that we use Saccharomyces cerevisiae, a particular species of yeast for fermentation of ale beer, while Lager, on the other hand, uses Saccharomyces pasturianum, and it uses much lighter um, malt for brewing Lager beer. So let's look at wine quickly. Wine making similar, you have the same thing, you substrate, you have the red grapes, you have the white grapes. Two of them go through the same process called maceration during physical processing. Simply, we try to crack them open, squeeze out the sugars that yeast is going to ferment, feed that to yeast, and make our wine. 
I like to point out here that the, in terms of making red wine, maceration lasts much longer. It can last as much as 28 days and at a much higher temperature of up to 30 degrees Celsius. The reason for that is that you want to extract a lot of phenolic compounds and tannins that are naturally present in the skin of that grape. That's what helps to give that dark color to it. In terms of the white wine, you can induce that as well, but we don't want it. So this process is at a lower temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius. A few hours to one day, you stop the process so that you can move to the next stage without darkening your wine. And after that, the next thing is fermentation, microorganisms, yeast again will break that down to get your wine. I like to point out here that you have natural or controlled fermentation when it comes to wine making. Natural fermentation is whereby some people will ferment the wine with the yeast naturally occurring in the grapes. So grapes, yeast are very smart. Just like when my mom was cooking back in the day, if I saw that she was cooking, I'd hang by the kitchen and help her, not because I loved helping her, because I knew she would give me lots of fish to eat. So the same thing with yeast. They will hang around the grape, knowing that when it breaks open, there's going to be sugar. So once you begin to break this open, naturally occurring yeast will begin fermentation at this stage. Some people don't add any other thing. They just let that fermentation run its course, and that's natural fermentation. But sometimes it comes out very good. Sometimes it's very, very yucky. It depends on what yeast is available in the environment. Controlled fermentation is whereby you actually finish the process of squeezing, you extract your juice, you use sulfur dioxide to remove as many microorganisms present as possible, then you inoculate your strain of yeast that you know how it, beha it behaves, you know it's going to give you the right flavor and color and all that, and then you can do your fermentation, and after that, that's a major difference between wine and beer is that we have a much longer aging, sometimes several, several years in terms of wine making. What happens during aging is that the alcohol present in the beer will begin to extract phenolic compounds from the uh, barrel, wooden barrel, and that will react with other compounds in the wine and create this amazing complexity of flavors and colors that give wine its really beautiful flavor over a long period of time. It's normal for wine to be acidic. We want it to be acidic a little bit. The reason for that, whether red or wine, is that it helps to remove bacteria that could spoil your wine. But if your wine is too acidic, it gets too sharp or tangy, you taste it, it's like it's hitting you on both sides, it's a bit sour. We don't want that. If it's way too acidic, it's usually because of one of these three compounds or acids. Malic acid, citric acid, and tartaric acid. All of them are present naturally in grapes. As you use up the sugars, they become more pronounced. They're likely to enhance the acidity of wine. But the most abundant is malic acid, way more abundant. This is what is typically responsible for acidity in wine. And often, if you notice that your wine during maturation is acidic, you want to induce extra fermentation during that secondary stage by either inoculating or seeing if a particular bacterium, which is a lactic acid bacterium called Onychocus onion, is present. If it's not, you can supply it. What it does is to break down this malic acid to a less acidic air compound that reduces the acidity of your wine. What it looks like over here is whereby you have malic acid at low pH, it's going to easily protonate and go into the cell. When it goes into the cell, the cell wants to remain neutral inside or closer to neutral pH-wise. Once it goes in there, it disrupts uh, the pH of the cell within. And this organism is very smart that it cleaves off one of the, the, the um, acidic groups, the carboxylic acid groups, cleaves it off. When you do that, it becomes lactic acid, and it ships it out outside the cell maintaining a high internal pH, but most importantly, you go from a compound that has two acidic groups to one that has one acidic group, significantly less acidic than what you started with. That reduces the acidity of the outside environment and reduces the tendency of that compound floating back into the cell, and that way the cell survives. Again, it thinks it's working for itself, it's actually working for us. So there are different kinds of wine, we can go into them, same as beer, but generally they are classified based on whether they're dark or white, same for beer or wine. But in between, you find a lot of differences depending on the fermentation process, where it's produced, the type of grape or grain used, uh, or the residu residual amount of sugar present. For instance, you have Moscato, much sweeter, white wine, but much sweeter because it has a high concentration of residual sugar after fermentation. You have Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc, which are mainly based on the grapes used to make them. And over there with beer making as well, sometimes we call them Belgian, depending on where they're produced. They're usually much sour than the beer we have here in the US. 
And in between as well, you have beer that would be either much darker than your regular ale and the ones that are a bit lighter than your regular lager. So with that, I'll say let's ferment, let's brew, and let's drink on. Thank you. Did you bring enough to share? Yes. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Can I figure this out? Hit. I have to click before I can hit. I'm a Mac guy. Me too. Totally useless. Where's the cursor? Where's the cursor? Can a tech person help us with this? If anyone sees a cursor anywhere, we're missing ours. Can you see it on the screen? No. Yes, it's on the screen. Crashed. Uh oh. I see it, but it's, it's, yeah, not, it's not here. It's, it's on the screen, but it's not here. All right. Well, I don't. And you are the end of the end of the third age of radio. I should have used my radio skills to cover that lacuna. Are we live? We are. Well, so. Can everyone hear me? So I'm Jim Reardon, as it says there. I'm from the Department of Physics here on campus. I'm grateful to Dan for inviting me to talk about the end of the third age of radio. But I have to admit, you've got the wrong person, because I'm probably the least qualified person in the physics department to talk about radio. Sometimes I think everybody in the physics department knows more about radio than I do. But I heard the story of what Professor Terry and his student Cyril Jansky did 106 years ago. And that's why I'm here tonight. I hope to pass on that story now, uh, despite the fact that you know, there are probably some of you more knowledgeable about radio than I am. So if we're talking about the third age of radio, there must be a first age of radio. So what was the absolute beginning of radio as far back as we can trace it in time? What do you suppose happens if I do that? Yes. The first age of radio, 1861. Dan told me not to show any equations, but I'm going to show you some equations. <laughs> and I hope you agree with me. Just after a moment of looking at that, those are some pretty complicated equations. If you study them for a few years, they may become slightly less complicated. But that's one of the most underwhelming series of equations I've ever seen in a scientific publication. This is from James Clerk Maxwell's original 1861 paper on physical lines of force, where he tries to make a th mathematical theory that can communicate the ideas of someone I guess I have to think of as his mentor, Michael Faraday, the son of the village blacksmith, a person with essentially no formal schooling, who nonetheless had ideas about electricity and magnetism that bore fruit. And here's Maxwell's attempt to formulate the ideas in the language of mathematics. That's, you know, that's complicated, verging on impenetrable. During the time Maxwell was writing this paper, he lost his job because his college merged with another college. And I'm afraid that if we had funding boards then, if they had funding boards then, the way that we have them now, that the conversation that he might have had with his funding agent at that time might have, might have gone something like this. The, Maxwell might have called up his funding agent and said, who is this? Maxwell. Yes, Max, how are you doing? What can we do for you? Oh, you need help supporting your research? That's great. What can you tell us? What are you doing? What are you doing? You're working on waves. Oh, yeah, I love to go to the beach. Waves, like water waves, right? Electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves. Well, waves in what? Waves in the ether? What's the ether? It's made of cylinders, rotating cylinders with bearings so they don't rub against each other. OK, OK, sounds promising. Uh huh. Where is this ether? Everywhere? It's all around us, all the time? Well, why can't we see it? It's transparent. 
Well, why don't we feel it? It's, in, it's sensitive to motion. Well, what is it good for? It can transmit vibrations. Undulation, undulations, sorry, undulations. Okay, it can transmit undulations. How does it do that? It's more rigid than steel. So if you whack it over here, the vibrations go over there. Is that what you said? You know, Max, I think there's a lot of opportunities in photography. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> so the point I had tried to make is that it took a very long time for these equations, which now are considered absolutely fundamental for our science, to penetrate. Something was trundling forward out of the unknown, but almost nobody realized it for a long time. But some people did, and some people tried to look for those waves. And in 1888, Heinrich Hertz succeeded in finding them. Heinrich Hertz of Germany, barely ahead of Oliver Lodge in England. But when Oliver Lodge read Hertz's paper scooping him, he became Hertz's greatest cheerleader. Another act of surprising loyalty, I would say, scientific loyalty, that gets transmitted from generation to generation in this field. So what's the second age of radio look like? That's the age of spark gap transmitters. Now, I don't have a spark gap transmitter to show you because they've been illegal since 1936. They're sort of like dinosaurs, and they're sort of like dogs. They're like dinosaurs in that you can make them really big. This is a photo of the now in radio telegraph station from Germany. By the time that the, our talk, the time of the end of the third age of radio, by 1919, that radio station could send its messages all over the world, no matter where you were. You would be able to pick up that station broadcasting from Germany. 11,000 miles of range. But there was one drawback. It was powerful, and their messages could reach the whole world. And they didn't really have any competition back then. But the problem was spark gap transmitters can only transmit Morse code. They're like barking dogs. A dog can go woof, woof, woof. It can go woof, bark, woof, bark, or something. But it can't really do more than that. So a spark gap transmitter, how does that work? It's, have you ever seen a lightning bolt? A lightning bolt is a lovely source of electromagnetic waves. <coughs> so all you need to do is arrange for some contraption that creates lightning bolts regularly, all the time. And then what you do is you press down your telegraph key that connects your lightning bolts to your antenna. And when you press down the key, electromagnetic waves spread joyously over the whole world. And when you let it go, there's silence. And that's the way a spark gap transmitter works. It transmits, however, only Morse code. How many people know Morse code here? Raise your hand. It's an acquisition. One, two, three, four, perhaps. That's limiting. You can't sell a lot of people a lot of stuff if you have to sell it in Morse code. So. I got to go forwards. In 1906, the third age of radio began. It was known spark gap transmitters were not really promising for the transmission of voice. And without voice, radio would never take off, would never become popular. In 1906, Lee DeForest of Council Bluffs, Iowa, in all places, invented the triode vacuum tube, the first device that was capable of oscillation. What's an oscillation? Well, would you agree that an oscillation perhaps could be termed a wave? So an oscillation is just something that goes back and forth in a regular manner. If you were to think of oscillations in terms of sound, the musical instrument that produces the purest oscillation is the flute. So I guess you could think of this triode vacuum tube as being sort of like a flute that can create a pure tone. However, this tone is far beyond the range of human hearing. It's not like the vacuum tube is the musical instrument. However, the oscillation allows you to transmit music and speech. For what is music and what is speech but a modulated oscillation? And that's the idea behind radio. If you can find something that can oscillate back and forth many times faster than the modulation needed for voice and music, then you can transmit voice and music. 
And that was the quest in the third age of radio. First, to make an oscillator that can oscillate fast enough, and then to modulate it by speech so that the human voice and music can be transmitted. So here I've just shown some typical speech patterns. And I hope that you would agree that these are oscillatory in character. Something is going back and forth. But they're, they're complex. They are complicated. They're not simple oscillations. That's what I mean by modulated. Those are modulated oscillations. So now we come to the subject of the talk. It is 1916, a few years before what I'm calling the end of the third age of radio. Lee DeForest, you remember Lee DeForest, from Council Bluffs, Iowa, in search of the big time, has gone to New York City. He tried to work for Tesla, but he found he was better off striking out on his own. By 1916, he was the inventor of the triode vacuum tube that could sustain an oscillation. He had figured out how to make them large enough and powerful enough to transmit voice through many miles. He had a radio station in Manhattan, in the center of New York City, that had several thousand subscribers. That should have been the end of the third age of radio right then. He had the patents, he had the knowledge, he had the backing. He should have been the start and the controller of radio from its beginning. But something happened. And what happened was World War I. So on World War, when World War I happened, as you know, there were already transmitters capable of transmitting thousands of miles. And the biggest one of all was located in Germany, the enemy. So on April 6, 1917, President Wilson declared that it was illegal to not only own a radio transmitter, but also a receiver. There are stories of government agents going from house to house looking for illegal radios, not transmitters, but receivers, and confiscating them. So that shut down the forest, and it shut down everyone in the world. Imagine what would happen right now if quantum computing, for example, became illegal. And quantum computing labs were forbidden. Well, for some reason lost to history, Earl Terry, professor of physics in the University of Wisconsin, got permission from the Department of the Navy in May of 1917 to resume research on radio. And he had the field all to himself. He knew that it was possible. It had been done, after all, already. But he had to do it himself. He had freedom, but he didn't have resources, except for his own hard-working ethic, and his graduate student, Cyril Jansky. So what did they do? They built bigger and better triode vacuum tubes. Terry and Jansky taught themselves how to blow glass. They taught themselves enough metal forming that they could, say, spot weld a nickel wire to a tungsten filament. They put together vacuum tubes that held vacuum long enough to be put into a radio transmitter. And for 22 months, they tried to transmit voice over significant distances, defined as from here to Chicago. So how did they do that? They made this. This is the version of their radio station, 9XM, as it appeared in the basement of Sterling Hall here on campus in the year 1917, which we have tried to replicate based on this photograph from Cyril Jansky. So I hope you notice some similarities between what's on the table and what's there. Of course, there are a few things. They didn't have radios like this in those days. But I hope to show you their transmitter <coughs> works. So here's a picture we also have from Cyril Jansky's thesis, a circuit diagram. By the way, if you're Cyril Jansky's thesis advisor, your student did good work, because we can get useful stuff out of his thesis 106 years later. Here is a figure from Cyril Jansky's master's thesis. It's that circuit there on the table that we have tried to build. So let's see if we can transmit some radio. The first thing we need to do is to make an oscillation. So I have brought, of course, something that Terry and Jansky didn't have, this oscilloscope. I wonder if we can show the oscilloscope on the screen. I'll power on the vacuum tubes. I have to admit, these are commercially available tubes. I have tried to make tubes. We have tried to make tubes to replicate 
according to Cyril Jansky's thesis, the tubes that they made. But they wouldn't survive being wheeled across University Avenue on a cart. Those people worked hard. Their tubes only lasted like a week. And they had to spend 20 hours to build new ones. And that's, I'm, I'm no Terry, and I am no Jansky. All right, so we have the tubes. Those of you who are old enough will remember the romance of waiting for your tubes to warm up whenever you wanted to listen to the radio. My tubes are warm. I need some plate voltage. If I can get enough voltage across the plate, I should be able to get my tubes to oscillate. So I need to change the time base. The time base got changed. You won't see the oscillation there. All right, so here's... The plate voltage is coming up. There's 50 volts. All right, there's an oscillation. This tube is oscillating. Can we see on the screen? You can't see on the screen because I don't have the measure on. We'll put the measurement on, on the frequency. How about that? 534 kilohertz. All right, I want to be on the AM radio band. That's a little bit low. I got to fiddle with this, just like they would have had to do. Every day, a slightly different frequency. If I pull this out a little bit, I can change the coupling and maybe get the frequency to go high enough at the expense of some amplitude. There, are we on the AM radio band now? 600 kilohertz, I think we are. I'll need a little bit more plate voltage to get the amplitude back up. That's great, so we got our, this is our oscillation. Is this modulated? Not yet. I gotta get the modulation going. So that's what the other tube does. The other tube is not part of the circuit until I close that switch. Let me set the time base so you can see frequencies that humans can hear. That's like one millisecond per division. That's something like that. Do we have modulation? One, two, three, four. Yes, I think we've got it. Modulation. Now we need just a, do we have a radio? Does anyone have an AM radio app on their phones? I have this radio here. If I hold it up to this microphone, there will be squeals and whistles and funny noises like you wouldn't believe. Can I ask you to hold this? Maybe up to that microphone. Is that thing on? All right, let's see what happens. If anyone can hear this. One, two, three, four. This is 9XM calling. 9XM calling. One, two, three. Do we have any audio? One, two, I'm sure we're transmitting. Passing cars are probably wondering what I'm talking about. 9XM calling, 9XM calling. One, two, three, four. Can you read? 9XM calling, Madison, Wisconsin. 10, 9, 8, A, B, C. Is that thing on? I heard a click. That's a good sign. One, two, three, four. 9XM calling, 9XM calling. Can you hear? All right. So, it works. <laughs> well, do I still have a few moments to close out the story? Please. So, I consider the end of the third age of radio then to be something like the last week in February or the first week in March when the UW press released that Terry and Jansky has succeeded in transmitting on a regular and routine basis audible and intelligible speech from the basement of Sterling Hall to North Chicago, where the Navy had a listening station. From that point on, anybody with enough time and energy and some knowledge could build their own radio transmitter because Terry and Jansky worked in a university and they didn't worry about patents and they didn't care about getting paid for their work because the university took care of them. And that's probably why I'm standing here today is because that act of, I don't know, loyalty to the community or to the art form or whatever. They wanted everybody to have the ability to make radio because they saw radio as a medium of transmitting knowledge. And so it is. All right, well, the postscript, I guess. Terry did sacrifice to uh, do this. He could have made a lot more money in industry, but he chose to stay here in the university working himself pretty hard to get this stuff going in addition to his teaching duties. I think he sacrificed in terms of money and perhaps an advancement, but I do have one slide. Here's a picture of the physics department in 1924. We've got, let's see, this is a laser pointer, isn't it? I'm not sure I know how this works. There it is. That person right there is Paul Ehrenfest, who's one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And this would have been close to the height of his fame. And here he is standing next to Earl Terry, who's front and center in the physics department. This is Earl Terry, the star of the show. So I feel that the physics department, or at least some of it, did, rep did recognize Terry's uh, abilities and achievements, despite the fact that he didn't turn out to be the quantum mechanics expert that I think he was hired to be. So that's probably enough. Why don't I stop there? The story of the end of the third age of radio, 
from the time they completed their work, radio just took off. And I hope that you continue to enjoy radio, even though it now has competitors it didn't used to have. All right, so much for radio. Thank you. Can you all hear me? I don't know if it's coming through the mic or not. But I'm used to lecturing. I, I had a text prepared, but everyone was so good at ad-libbing, I guess I'm going to have to do the same thing, because I don't want to let down the side for the humanists. So I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to do something quite insane, which is going to give you a brief history of museums and the stories they tell. And museums, of course, uh, serve various purposes, but I'm, I'm going to really primarily focus on the art museum because that's something I know a little bit about because I'm an art historian and I actually practically live in the, uh, in the Elvium building, which is part of the Chazen Museum of Art. But I was prompted to give this talk because Daniel asked me to recognize an important anniversary. It's a kind of weird anniversary, 230 years <laughs> since the the foundation of the Louvre as a public museum. Uh, of course, we're here because we're celebrating an important anniversary for the university, 175 years. Uh, but it took quite a bit longer for the university to have its own art museum, although there were works of art that were given to the campus at various points. Our museum, our university museum, goes back just over 50 years in the Elvium building, which was founded as the Elvium Art Center in 1970. The Louvre, on the other hand, had its precursors in the royal collections. And in fact, the Louvre started its life as a, a royal palace. But what I really want to talk to you about is uh, the kind of duality. And when we're at a university, we like to look back at the history of an institution, but we also like to look forward. Where are they going? So I'm going to try and do something of that. Uh, it's a little bit ambitious. But I also want to recognize that museums you know, have, have different kinds of functions. Yes, they will tell, if they're art museums, a certain history, a certain version of the history of art. But they are also places that focus our attention. Svetlana Elpers, an art historian, describes museums as a way of seeing. So the way in which objects are arranged and selected and collected in museums. They, they tell different kinds of stories. They are also places that single out attention on the objects that are on display or in cases. And here I'm showing you a photograph by the German photographer Thomas Struth, uh, his Musée du Louvre series, in which you see that sense of attention, the people gazing towards uh, the Raft of Medusa by Jericho, one of the great masterpieces of, of French uh, 19th century painting. But I'm also including uh, a reference here to a recent exhibition at the Chazen Museum of Art, which shows the sort of forward-moving aspect of museums as trying to rethink their collections and the stories that are told even by individual works of art. And so we'll get to that. But first, what is a museum? Uh, we like to use etymology to sort of figure out things. And museum uh, comes from the Greek word, museum. It is a palace of muses, a habitation of the muses, which in Greek culture embody the different arts. And here we see a painting by Jacopo Tintoretto, a Venetian painter of the 16th century. And we see the, the god 
Uh, Apollo is the sun god coming down from on high with the nine muses, which represent different branches of culture. They represent music, but they also represent religion. They represent um, the visual arts. They represent poetry, tragedy, comedy. But also thrown in there is astronomy and justice. So together they encompass the aspects of creativity which shed knowledge about the world. And this is a science conference that we're part of here. And scientia is the Latin word for science, and it means knowledge. So museums can be understood in some senses as storehouses of creative knowledge, ways of understanding the world. Now, one of the first museums I know about, or at least what we could call a museum space, was actually part of the Athenian Acropolis in Athens from the middle of the fifth century before the Common Era. The Propylaea, which is the monumental entrance to the Athenian Acropolis, once had an art gallery on one side, a picture gallery. We really don't know what was in it. We just know that it served that function. In order to think about what might have been in there, uh, we can go to Pompeii. Uh, and here we're looking at one of the magnificent frescoes a Roman fresco, but in the style of a Greek painting. Uh, and uh, it is in the Ixion room, and it shows uh, the illusion of a painted panel on the wall. There are also theatrical masks and other things, and there are neat, neat vistas. But what I want you to focus on is this display of uh, a mythological work, uh, clearly intended to be a kind of focus of attention, this probably served as a kind of dining room, a kind of conversation piece, but it's also an exercise in demonstrating knowledge of Greek mythology and a certain sense of taste for the classical mode of illusionistic representation, making things appear lifelike on a two-dimensional surface, have sculpted presence. Uh, so there was a taste established for the classical already in the Roman period, and that has had a tremendous impact on even present-day museums. Towards the end of the Roman Empire, there was this habit also of collecting things in what you could call open-air museums. Um, this is the Hippodrome, the racetrack of Roman Constantinople, in present-day Istanbul. And we see assembled along the spina, which was the spine of the racetrack in the center, are antiquities that were collected from elsewhere. They were part of the booty or spolia, the spoils of war from the Roman Empire. It's far-flung territories that included Greece and Egypt. So the great obelisk here of Thutmosis was brought uh, by uh, uh, by the Romans to Constantinople and eventually set up in the fourth century. It's quite an amazing thing to, to have transported this obelisk all the way from Egypt. Um, and then on the other side, we see uh, the bronze uh, serpent column which came from Delphi, where the oracle was. Uh, and that in itself also commemorated um, a, a Greek victory uh, at Plataea. So these are historical objects that evoked the uh, the places that they came from, but also they were part of an expression of imperial power. And that's something that happens in later museums as well. Uh, another contributing factor to establishing the idea of museums, collecting antiquities in particular, another important step is the establishment of private collections in the uh, 16th century in particular. And here we're looking at the Palazzo Grimani in Venice, which has recently reassembled a quite extensive collection of antiquities that includes portrait busts of Roman emperors, but also naked Greek goddesses. And this is a cardinal, a prelate of the, of the Catholic Church. Well, this is partly the, the taste of antiquity. The idea in the Renaissance, of course, was to revive a knowledge and even recreate works in the style of antiquities. And so we see being reinforced this idea of antiquities as, as the model for, for good art, art that should then be imitated by artists and collected and displayed as a model of, of good taste and the aesthetics of beauty. 
uh, even the Vatican museums uh, began really this way in terms of collection of antiquities, some of which were recently unearthed. And it was under Pope Julius II, the, the famous pope who commissioned Michelangelo to do a number of works in the Vatican, that, that some of the great works of antiquity came into the Vatican Museum, including the Belvedere Torso, the Belvedere Torso, uh, which was then an inspiration for Michelangelo's muscular figures in the Sistine Chapel. And so this also shows you an important aspect of museum collections and their objects, that they're they are sources of inspiration for contemporary artists. They, they always have been and they always will be. It's where, where artists learn, uh, in a sense, their, their craft and they get inspired by other works. And so certainly that's the case uh, for Michelangelo. So getting back to the Louvre, the example we started out with, the Louvre itself began as a, a collection Particularly, it was Francis I, Francois I, uh, in the 16th century, who began to collect modern art. And by modern art, I mean modern art of Italy from the late 15th and early 16th century. Uh, so again, we have to think about museums often started out, and they were modern when they started out, and then they became <laughs> museums of old things because over the centuries, their collections aged. And so that's the case with the Louvre. Before it was officially a museum, it was a private collection of the king. And he got the best examples of Italian art. And Italian art uh, was, was again known to be trying to emulate antiquity. And famously, one of the founding writers about art history, Giorgio Vasari, in the 16th century, wrote a history of Italian art. He wrote it as the idea of artistic progress. And so when we look at this old photograph of the way the Mona Lisa, the famous example of Leonardo's work in the Louvre was displayed, it was displayed as part of a linear narrative of time, but also artistic progress. And still, if you go to the Louvre today, you'll see the works from the Italian <coughs> Trecento, that's the 14th century, and you'll look through Giotto, uh, and then you'll go on into the next gallery of the 15th century. So there's this idea that time is represented through the history of style and through the arrangement of works in a pathway in the museum. Now, of course, in the modern Louvre, the Mona Lisa is one of these examples that's known as a kind of superstar. Everyone's heard of the Mona Lisa uh, and her enigmatic smile, and everyone wants to see her. So now the Mona Lisa has been sort of excerpted from this narrative of history and placed in a kind of reliquary-like case for observation for a few seconds as you line up and everyone takes their selfies. So it's become a sort of like going to Madame Tussauds. You take your photograph with your famous star. You do this in the museum as well. So there's a different way of seeing the museum than from the planners of this museum early on. So antiquities too are part of the museum's collection. And again, the royal collections, there was this whole room preserved here from, from the 17th century, uh, the, uh, the Salon des Caritides, which refers to the Cariatids. And, and these are based, these are, uh, these are uh, 18th century uh, copies or 17th century copies of the, or reimagination of the Greek antiquities on the uh, Acropolis. So they're actual antiquities and their imitations of antiquities. So, of course, the royal collection was doing the same thing that the Pope was doing and other uh, independent collectors. But the collection doesn't stay still. And over time, other things were acquired through a different phase of collecting, which is the phase of archaeology in the 19th century. And it's partly the product of empire, uh, whereby France extends its territorial grasp, but all of, also its ambitions in terms of collecting from different parts uh, of, of the world. And so the wing victory of Samothrace didn't come into the collection until a French archaeologist discovered it in 1863. And so the spoils of that archaeological dig then came to Paris. But when the Louvre was founded as an actual public museum, a significant change occurs. And that is that, again, it's art of the present that is being collected. So the museum becomes a way of asserting a new narrative of France as an independent 
as, a, as a republic and then as, a, uh, as an empire, and uh, the displaying of recently painted works like uh, uh, this, this wonderful work by Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People, a kind of symbol of the French Revolution, uh, painted in 1830. Uh, a little earlier, we have here this, uh, this example of, of Napoleon uh, being crowned as, as emperor by Jacques-Louis David. But also in the Louvre, there's something that takes us back to uh, medieval uh, works and a medieval kind of precursor of the museum. The Louvre today has the treasury of the medieval monastery of Saint-Denis just outside of Paris. And uh, here we see in this 18th century view the variety of objects that were on display in medieval church treasuries. Of course, they're reliquaries, busts of the saints containing their heads and other relics, shrines, but also precious materials that were refashioned by artifice, by human artifice, into precious objects. And Abbot Suje of Saint-Denis, who collected many of these objects in the 12th century, actually gave us a very detailed account of what he really wanted to achieve by collecting these things. First of all, it was the precious materials that were being worked by craftsmen into wonderful objects. But secondly, it was the prestige of antiquity, where these materials came from, um, many of these objects, like the Chalice of Suje, which you can see in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., um, are uh, reused objects. It was a uh, Hellenistic fluted cup that then was made into a chalice for the Christian mass uh, with a new foot and all of this metalwork designed uh, by the craftsman working for Suje. But he also recorded in this other object um, the the sequence of donations, the biography of this object. It had originally been given to the grandfather of Eleanor of Aquitaine by uh, a certain Mitadulos, uh, probably an Islamic prince from Spain. Uh, it's a very precious work in rock crystal. And that vessel was then given eventually from William of Aquitaine to Eleanor, his granddaughter, and she gave it to her husband, Louis VI, didn't last very long, that marriage. Uh, and then uh, the king of France gave it to Abbot Suger, and he said he gave it to the saints, to Saint-Denis and the saints. So there's this interest, which is part of museum culture, of recording that kind of provenance of where things come from. In the case of Suger, it was about the prestige of his abbey, all of these prestigious donors of the past. And then we come to the Natural History Museum, which expands on that idea of the materials from nature to really look at the natural world in terms of specimens. And this is one of the earliest visualizations of a cabinet of curiosity. So this is the precursor to the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum. We can see a, an alligator suspended from the ceiling. We see seashells and various birds, stuffed birds. We see books that convey the sense of knowledge that you need to understand all of the natural world. Uh, on the other side, we see from the 17th century uh, this depiction of a cabinet that expands from the natural world to include depictions of nature and landscape uh, through uh, landscape painters. Uh, and uh, so you kind of combine then in this model the uh, the wonder of nature with the wonder of human artifice. Now this brings me to the Museum of Natural History in New York. This is an interesting museum because it combines aspects that, that relate, go all the way back to the dinosaurs. So tracing the history of animal life, the history of geology, uh, the history of the world in many different aspects, also astronomy. But what's really peculiar to me, always struck me, is that it also, in addition to human origins, it also includes the art of the Northwest Coast. Uh, so we have human artifice, human works of art, as well as peoples included within what is otherwise uh, devoted to, to natural history. And so you're, you're, here is an old view of the Northwest Coast Hall. Uh, and so this is a different kind of display than you find in an art museum. 
Uh, it's a different kind of classification, which refers to sort of ethnographies. And ethnos in Greek can be translated also as race. Uh, the ethnographical collections were distinguished from fine art. So it reflects how the history of museums had certain exclusions. We've seen the inclusion of the classical tradition and antiquities and of contemporary artists from Europe, but uh, there is this blind spot when it comes to indigenous cultures because they didn't fit the European model. Uh, rather, they fit this idea of sort of primitive culture, so-called primitive culture, underdeveloped because it didn't have the same uh, terms of visual and aesthetic taste uh, that we've seen in the classical tradition that dominated the concept of the museum in Europe. Fortunately, <laughs> things are changing, uh, but you know, to begin with, there were dioramas of human beings aside animals. Uh, this is an extraordinary thing to me to think of that. You wouldn't do that for the, the Europeans, but you, you're, you can do that for the ethnographically related peoples. Uh, so they've done some changes in the museum recently. They've redisplayed things, and what's different is they invited the indigenous communities to share their oral knowledge of the traditions. And things are not sort of piled quite as high as they used to be. There's greater selectivity. And they're also questioning, they include some of the old dioramas to call into question this kind of peaceful narrative of the indigenous peoples surrendering their land uh, to, the, uh, to the Dutch as they come to colonize New York. So, New narratives, old material, but new narratives. And one of the groundbreaking uh, artists uh, who has done installations that question old ways of seeing in museums is Fred Wilson. His Mining the Museum exhibition at the Maryland Historical Society brought things out of storage that had not previously been displayed. So, Alongside these, these beautiful objects in silver and pewter uh, designed for the elites of New England, he brought out uh, these shackles that had been used for an enslaved person, the same metal material. And alongside elegant wooden chairs, uh, he brought out a lynching pole. These were things that were in the collection, but they'd been buried. And so this allowed people visiting the museum to see things in a different light. What made it possible for the luxury goods to be produced and to be used by the ruling elites? This brings us to our own university museum, which has taken up this challenge recently of thinking again about works that have been in the collection a long time. And I'm referring here to Thomas Ball's Emancipation Group from 1873 which, as you can see, by its material, white marble, but also by its style, is, is heavily indebted to that classical tradition that I referred to as a kind of basis for the stories that museums have told for a very long time. Uh, it shows Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he's issued the Emancipation Proclamation to emancipate the slaves. And we see here he stands up as this kind of great white fatherly figure uh, almost blessing the crouching figure of the recently freed enslaved person. There's a clear hierarchy in this work that is brought out in a response piece that was in the exhibition called Remancipation, a rethinking of this emancipation. Because obviously for us today, this raises a lot of troubling questions about the way the uh, black African enslaved person is depicted, even at the moment of his being freed. Uh, and so when the work by Sanford Biggers, who is an African-American artist, we see that that questioning results in a reversal of roles. What do we think when we see Frederick Douglass, the great exponent of abolition of slavery, a great African-American intellectual? He's now the figure who is standing. Abraham Lincoln, uh, covered by this uh, quilt, uh, which is being lifted up. Uh, is uh, looking down somewhat despondently, and he's barefoot. He's in a position of humility uh, rather than a statuous figure. So by juxtaposition, we have a rethinking of a familiar piece that many people might have just passed by or ignored or thought, oh, that's great, it's Abraham Lincoln. But this raises questions. I want to conclude 
with a museum that I think is very compelling. It's not an art museum per, per se, but it tells a very important story. And I think like the Remancipation Exhibition, it allows us to think about the recuperative aspect of museums and the story they tell. This is a trauma memorial that we're all familiar with. September 11th, 2001, when the Twin Towers in New York, the World Trade Center, was brought down. It was a horrible day, and you have to deal with the emotions of that day, the loss of life, and how do you do it? Well, traditionally, you construct a memorial, and that is part of the complex that we see here at the World Trade Center site. The imprint of the two Twin Towers has been preserved, but now it is a place for reflection with names of the deceased, memorialized, remembering, just as museums remember the past through objects of art. But then you go into the museum, and there is a pathway that takes you down into the depths. And it's really a, a journey that sort of reminds me of the narrative of Dante's uh, divine comedy. You descend into the inferno, the place that was literally an inferno. But you are taken on a journey through time, September 11th, all of the moments in that day, through voices, but also through images. And most importantly for my argument, through the objects. The objects tell you the story. This is ancient history now. This is a flip phone. But it, it takes on meaning uh, because it, it is an object that was attached to a human being, someone who lost their life. And it helps tell the story with a driver's license and some glasses. These are material manifestations of, of some of the human beings who were victims of that day. And so museums can do that. They can shed light. They can be moments for reflection and memory. And even the tangled metal can become a moment of aesthetic appreciation like a modern sculpture because of the way it's lit and singled out. It speaks to the power of that fire and that, that horrific event. And of course the last, uh, you know, the, the last standing pier uh, on the site of the World Trade Center which was a place for photographs and messages that recorded the individuals, the firefighters who fought off the tremendous fire. It's really moving, and it's even hard to talk about. But what this museum does is then it brings the people back to life in their photographs. Um, so you have this memory wall. And these are very much like icons in the religious tradition. They allow you to focus on these people made whole again through their images. And after that, you walk back up into the light. And then you come to the reflecting pools, and you have another moment in this kind of garden setting. And so that's where I want to stop, because I think this shows you the power of the museum. Ultimately, the power of the museum is that it can become a kind of sacred space for reflection and for thought. So thank you. I'd like to thank our four brilliant presenters. Thank you all so much. This is what makes Soundwave so much fun for me. So this whole year, we're thinking about the passage of time, reflecting on the past. And of course, reflecting on the past also makes us think about the present. And my role here is to talk about music. Classical music, I mean, we call it classical music, so we're thinking about our relationship to music of the past. And um, if you look at the title of my talk, play it like they played it. Uh, it might, might be a little puzzling, but I'm gonna try to bring things around to show you what I mean. So if you think about, say, the music that Mozart wrote over 200 years ago, the instruments that he wrote for are pretty different from the instruments we play now. For instance, my instrument is the French horn. It didn't have any valves at the time that Mozart was writing. And you had to cover the bell of the horn with your hand and 
Uh, the open notes went do 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 do, and the closed notes went eh, 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 eh. and Mozart wrote his music for horn with that sound in mind. So now I have to think when I play those pieces, in what way do I need to be informed by what Mozart was thinking? Is there some kind of moral issue here? Am I supposed to play Mozart's music on the kind of horns that Mozart wrote that music for? If I'm a pianist, which I very much am not, am I supposed to not play that music on a piano forte, the modern piano, which didn't exist, but rather on a forte piano, the instrument that Mozart had in his ear? And you can see how this is complicated, because in fact, if I'm writing a piece for an instrument with a particular sound, I'm the composer. That's the sound I'm expecting. So you might ask yourself, what would Mozart think of the modern French horn, the modern piano, the modern flute? And we don't know. I was just having a conversation on the way over about these issues with my brother, who plays the modern cello. And he was saying, Mozart would love the Steinway Grand Concert Grand Piano. He would love it, which I like to think is probably true because it's an amazing instrument, but we simply don't know. It's a question of aesthetics, but it runs a little bit deeper than that. Because if you think about it, I had a teacher, and my teacher had a teacher, and my teacher's teacher had a teacher, and you don't go back very far before you find somebody who played Beethoven's horn sonata for Beethoven, or Mozart's horn concertos in front of Mozart. So we have a tradition of teaching, and the student mostly tries to sound like the teacher. On the other hand, because there are many hands in this discussion, there's a fantastic concept developed by Harold Bloom, a scholar of literature at Yale when I was in school. And he coined the term the anxiety of influence, and it runs like this. I have a teacher who plays in a certain way, but I'm an artist. I want to be original, so I need to move away from my teacher said. What, and the kinds of playing that he advised, because I want to have my own voice. And then my students, I give them advice, and then as they develop, they want their own voice. So we have not only a continuous tradition that feeds the past into the present, but also a continuous tradition of rejecting the past. And how am I supposed to come to terms with this when I'm playing the Beethoven horn sonata? Am I doing it right by playing it with my own ideas? Am I doing it wrong because I'm playing a modern instrument and not the old instrument, which Beethoven clearly had in mind? So these are difficult issues to grapple with. So you might say, let's be like some of the people on the Supreme Court. Let's be originalists. Let's go back to the original manuscripts and see what's in them. And maybe that will give us an idea of what, how we need to play. So classical music, for the most part, especially until nowadays, it's largely notated. We have musical notation. It's an incredible system in which so much information is communicated very efficiently. But if you think about it, there's also a tremendous lack of information in our notation system. For instance, we have dynamics. How loud or soft? We usually use Italian descriptions. Piano means soft, forte means loud, fortissimo means really loud, pianissimo means really soft, and then we have the mezzos, mezzo, medium, medium, loud, medium, soft. So we have basically a realm of dynamics, of volume, that's divided into six parts. But my realm of dynamics, Connor Nelson's realm of dynamics, is divided into infinite parts. So how loud, how soft, we don't really know. If I have a series of quarter notes that last one beat, ba, 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 do I play da, 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 da? Do I play dum, 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 dum? Do I play dum, 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 dum? You can begin to get an idea of what you should play from some of the notation. And in fact, some composers, and Mahler springs to mind, are when you look at their, the music that they wrote, their orchestral music, 
it seems like Mahler is just frantic to try to get the player to play it exactly as Mahler hears it. There's marks on every single note. There's slurs, slurs with lines, slurs with dots, dynamics constantly changing, as if he's searching for a way to communicate, this is how you should play my music. Even if you do everything you're told, there's infinite possible interpretive things that you could arrive at, conclusions, ways to play. So are we supposed to play it like they played it? Are we supposed to figure out how the originals played it? Are we supposed to be individual and creative? And this is the space, it's a narrow lane that we swim in because we have the notes and the rhythms given to us we have the dynamics given to us. We have the articulations, whether we tongue the notes or slur the notes, whether we bow separate or all together. This is given to us. But within that space, we find an infinite realm of interpretive possibilities so that we can simultaneously attempt to get ourselves into the world that the composer is giving us, is presenting to us, on, not only on paper, but through the tradition of our teachers and now our recordings. Not only that, but also we have our own voice that we can find. Fortunately, nowadays, music is disseminated so widely. It is so easy to listen to different performances of music. If you have access to YouTube or Spotify, you can listen to recording after recording after recording. And if you listen very, very casually, and if you have no knowledge at all of classical music, you might say to yourself, well, a lot of this sounds kind of the same. But as you get into it, you start hearing the voice of the performer, and that's where it gets so exciting. How does this one individual reckon with the whole history of classical music and what's being written on the page and turn it into a personal interpretation? And so the answer, should we play it like they played it, is, to me at least, there is no should. The only should is to develop a voice, an artistic voice an interpretive voice that's grounded in the information that we have, but that's expressive to our audience, and hopefully our voice will reach our audience. We have today to perform Connor Nelson, talk about expressive players. Connor is relatively new uh, on the faculty of the Mead Witter School of Music. I think this is your fourth year here, and I've been fortunate to have known Connor for quite a few years. Come on up. Uh, before that, we've been playing together for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And so I was so thrilled when Connor agreed to pr perform on Soundwaves. Because as those of you who've been here before know, we always end each program with a performance. And I want to talk to Connor just a little bit, not only about his interpretive voice, and not only about the piece, but also about the flute and what it is, and to tie, the, well, this is a piece that's largely about time and memory, but I also um, tried to sort of humorously think this is approximately the 30,000th anniversary of the existence of the flute as an instrument, so we fit right in with the anniversaries as well. So obviously this flute is not a 30,000-year-old flute that would have been dug up in a prehistoric site. So um, it's, first of all, can you tell us what is a flute? How does it make a noise? How do you make a flute with no technology or very limited technology? What does it look like? What does it do? You could make a flute out of a carrot. You could make one out of a bone. People have been doing it for, for ages. And the flute I'm holding here was devised by a jeweler slash flutist slash composer in the 1830s that said, you know, we've got a lot of notes to play, and we need something a lot more efficient. So in the classical era, in the Baroque era, basically you would have had something that resembled, would have resembled far more a tube of wood with holes. And then keys were added eventually until you have this um, solid gold monstrosity with silver keys here in front of you today. So if you're playing music by Bach, just to get back to what I was talking about. You're playing a piece by Bach. He wrote for the flute. <laughs> he didn't write for this flute. Bach died Absolutely in 1750. Not. This thing did not exist. Nothing close. Nothing close. So how do you feel about playing Bach on this flute? Terrified. 
<laughs> no, it's not just because of the difference in the instrument itself, but of course we have no recorded examples of anyone from the era, let alone Bach himself. And I approach that music with the utmost humility, knowing, basically knowing, that whatever I play will likely sound absolutely nothing like what he might have Im imagined, not just because of the instrument, but because our ears themselves <laughs> have changed so much. And I was very touched by what she said, and I think that time is gone. <laughs> and I do imitate um, players of historic, you know, playing historical flutes all the time to try to get closer to pay an homage. But um, I think it's something that's in the heart and also that just has to be allowed to live is probably my number one objective. Do you feel a connection through your teacher and your teacher's teacher and your teacher's teacher's teacher and so on back to the past in a way that you feel nourishes your own interpretive abilities and your own voice? Well, in the around, starting around 1960s, 70s, um, historical performance uh, became far more prevalent in the United States and within the entire world. And when I say historical performance, those who are playing the instruments of the time in the most informed way possible. Although modern versions often of those instruments, not always, but yes. So especially. you get into a very tangled web. Oh, indeed. And so my teachers would be would have been far less interested in the historical performance. I would say from the generation that they came from. So when I started to play w without vibrato and Im imitating art articulations that I heard historical performers play, they said, son, what are you doing? <laughs> so, um, so absolutely yes in probably every other example of, you know, in every music of almost every other era but absolutely no for Baroque music. For Takamitsu, in which I have to imitate the Japanese flute, the shakuhachi, and no flutes, that, that's a world of inspiration, of course, that's entirely, entirely different and has me using my mouth, my lips, my air, everything in an entirely different fashion from Bach or Mozart. Tell us a little bit about those flutes. How do they differ? Do they not have keys? Are they simpler? Are they more complicated? Um, generally, no keys. Um, and the technique, the music kind of dictates technique. So on the shakuhachi, for example, there's all these kind of violent mo movements. the performer would <laughs> create um, a s a sound worlds with their air that we almost ne certainly never would in Mozart, for example, the pitch going <laughs> And you'll hear that all through, all throughout this work. And in what way is this work um, concerned with time, with memory? Well, I guess nothing uh, demarcates time more than death, more so than death. And the very last note of this work is said to be the soul of Isamu Noguchi leaving his body. Here's Toru Takamitsu's itinerant. You want to play that last note first? Oh, yeah. Do it. <laughs> so let's now hear Toru Takamitsu's itinerant in memory of Isamu Noguchi, played by Connor Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> 